right, so today's topic is identifying your skills. So this is my favorite um, topic to cover in creative job search because I think it's foundational to everything we do here. If you haven't identified your skills, and many people, by the way, haven't, uh, it's very hard to find jobs that interest you, to effectively apply for those jobs, to answer interview questions, and to effectively network. Uh, many people don't think of this when they start their job search. And I'm hoping after today, yeah, I've given you a little bit of a heads up on some things that could benefit you as you maybe are starting or continuing your job search as far as uh, skills identification. So in some of these uh, slides, I'll be asking you some questions and, and asking you to put some information into the chat box. Some of the questions are rhetorical and I'm going to give you the answer right away. It'd be kind of silly to have you answer some of these. Uh, but I'll let you know when that is. So the first thing I'm going to put out is what is a skill? And I'm going to define that for you by saying that a skill is anything you can do. And I don't mean breathe or walk. I'm saying it's anything you can do well, something you have uh, developed over your career and it's something you pride yourself in or have been told by others that you do well. So in the chat box, I'd like you to answer this question. How many skills do you think the average person has? Okay, this is you, this is everybody. What is the average? Just put a number in there. Okay, we've got five, we've got seven, 28, 750, 100, 510. Um, you're gonna see a wide variety of answers here. Some, um, some of them because someone may have taken this class before, some uh, because you know, some people do not know or have never identified their skills. Um, so there'll be a very wide variety of answers. The average answer to this uh, is pretty shocking, but I'm gonna tell you the answer first. Uh, the actual answer is 500 to 800. The reason for this is not obvious when you look at it for the first time. The first time I saw this, I was skeptical to say the least, uh, because I would say, you know what? I consider myself to be fairly skilled and I could maybe give you five. Um, and someone had asked me, well, what are those skills? And at the time I was a computer trainer. So I said, I am really good at letting people know how to use computers. So I'm a computer trainer, that's one of my skills. And it was broken down for me in that that is a job title, that's a job description, that's not a skill set. The skill sets are what you use to perform that task, to do that job. So instead of saying, I am a computer trainer, the skills involved would be uh, facilitation or teaching, uh, curriculum development, um, patience, and then the 20 or 30 uh, computer programs that I teach. So Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Photoshop, QuickBooks, uh, the various versions of that, the specialities within those programs. Um, so we very quickly expand what we define as a skill set once we look at the component parts. And that's really important because very few people will ask you to define your relevance to the, their job in your terms. Meaning that if I were to apply for a, tra a trainer position, what I would consider to be a trainer position, they may describe it as a facilitator or as an instructor or you know, as a, an Excel um, person, whatever that happens to be. So I can make connections to needs by identifying what I do overall, and then finding the right jobs that fit that. And if we only have five to 10 skill sets that we've got identified, that becomes very limiting. Um, now, not all of these skills are transferable to any given job. Um, I'm a juggler, I juggle, I ride a unicycle, but there aren't any clown jobs out there that I've seen to this point. So even though I consider that to be a skill set, it's not in most cases marketable, but don't limit yourself. Have fun with it. Take a blank piece of paper and just write down everything that you know how to do well, that interests you or that you're just good at. And then when you're looking at jobs, you're looking for those words, you're looking for those connections. Um, that's the first step I do in a job search. I, I look again at, have I developed any new skills? Do I have any new interests? Is there anything else I'd like to explore? Um, I don't limit that based on what's available because at that point, I don't know what's available or what will be available in the near future. Um, so just a blank piece of paper and a pen is, is really your first step. The average person 
average person can identify 10 skill sets. So I, I hope this gives you a little idea of, of how important this could be. If you can only identify 10 and you have a lot more to offer, you're really leaving a lot off the table. Now, the reason this is important is the percentage of people who cannot identify, sell, or prove their skills in an interview hovers right around 80%. Now, that's an important figure based on how I interview. So when I interview candidates for a job, I usually interview five. I mean, that's the number I usually shoot for. I look for five qualified candidates. So I look at their resumes and they've at least met the minimum qualifications and they've developed some interest. Now I bring them in for the interview. Now, unless it's a previously held connection, someone I knew in the past or someone who's been, I've been given a heads up on by someone I know, like, and trust, um, I'm looking at all five of these candidates with a fresh set of eyes. I'm just saying, okay, now come and prove to me that you can do what I need you to do. The person I hire in almost all cases is not the person who can do the job the best because I'll never have an idea or a knowledge of that because I'm not gonna hire all five of them. I don't know who will do the job best. What I do know is the skills they've identified and sold to me that relate to my needs. And that's what I make my decision off of. So this is the reason that some people who are really, really good at what they do don't get the job that they're most qualified for because they haven't sold their skills effectively. And that's why I think, um, it's really important to think about what skills do I have that are most important to this employer's needs, and then developing strategies to market those skills through my resume, through my application, and certainly through the interview. We talk about all of those topics as we go along in this six-part series. We're going to focus on applications a little bit today um, once we've identified some skills, but the first step is identifying what you have to offer. So we develop skills through a wide variety of experiences. And I put these in order, ah, they're not necessarily in order, but the, the biggest one is work experience. Employers are most likely to value skills developed through work experience. That does not mean you can't market skills that are developed outside of your work experience. Because if you haven't had the opportunity to do something through work, don't leave it off the table simply because you've developed it through a, a volunteer position or a hobby. I'm just saying that the most important usually is work experience. But we develop skills through education, certainly through volunteer work. Uh, one of the ones that people leave off the table in many cases is socializing with people. If you are really good at engaging people in conversation, you're just a naturally um, extroverted person who makes people feel comfortable, that's huge. Customer service is one of the key components of any job, whether that be internal customers, which are your coworkers, or external customers, which is the traditional customer we sell our goods and services to. And socializing is such a huge part of that. Um, so don't, that's a little harder to define. It's a little harder to prove, but it's something that certainly should be mentioned if it's a skill you have. Um, hobbies, I, I'd be a little careful on that one. We all have hobbies, uh, hope everyone has hobbies. Uh, anyone who says they don't have hobbies, we talk for a little bit and they'll say, well, I like going for walks or I like to read. That's a hobby. Um, if you have work experience that meets an employer's needs, you don't necessarily have to reinforce it through hobbies. And I am not a big believer in showing an employer on a resume that you're a well-rounded person who likes to do a lot of different things. If there's a specific identified uh, need in a, an application or in a job posting that's looking for a well-rounded individual with a variety of, of interests, then certainly you could put that in there. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they give an employer too much information. A resume should be a very focused marketing piece. Um, there are certain things of hobbies that people will put in there if they're like really interesting. Um, I've had the opportunity to deal with a couple of um, I hate to say this is a hobby, but Olympians resumes. And you just can't leave that off your resume. I mean, it creates too much interest. So if you've done something that was, you know, can demonstrate a skill set like uh, dedication and follow through and all sorts of different things, that can certainly take a place in your resume because it demonstrates a skill set. But don't put hobbies on there in most cases just to show that you have, you know, a wide variety of interests. Now, sports shows a lot of organizational skill sets. 
Um, there's a lot of different things you can do through that. Uh, think about if you haven't done something in a work experience, where have you done it elsewhere? And uh, one of the big ones is leadership. So if you've never been a manager or a supervisor, but you've coached or you've led a safety meeting, or you've done other things. There are different ways of defining that. As long as you're telling the truth and explain the situation, uh, there are different ways of, of demonstrating a skill set outside of maybe how you defined it in the past. Uh, we never lie on a resume or an application, but we certainly can use the same terms that the employer uses to describe our skill sets. So we use, of course, all the above to. Um, develop our skills. And, and certainly we can use all of these situations to pull from to uh, demonstrate and market our skills. So before we go into our first set of questions to see if there's any questions, I'm, I'm going to test your knowledge on skill sets. Um, just in your in your mind, think about what are the skills that are most important to employers. Now, while you're thinking of that, the question, the first question that might come into your mind is, well, that would be very way too much because there's so many different types of jobs. How could we make a blanket statement on what employers value most? I mean, the type of work I go for, employers don't value welding, but in welding jobs, they would certainly value that. So it seems like kind of a strange question. The reason we ask it is, this is a kind of a surprising answer to me. The answer is soft skills, people skills. Will you fit in? Will you adapt? Will you learn? Um, those are really important skill sets, especially at interview. I, I really stress this because at least half of your interview will be about those skill sets. They brought you in for the interview because you've demonstrated that you have the experience for the job. Now they want to see if they want to hire you, whether you'll fit in. Uh, and by fit in, I mean, are you adaptable? Will you, are you willing to learn? Are you in the right industry? Those are soft skills um, and people will spend a lot of time documenting how they've done a task. Very little time is spent on how they got along with their coworkers, how they've dealt with conflict, how they handle um, change. Change is a big one. Uh, they adapting. Um, has, in the chat box, I just want anyone to put in this if they've experienced this. Has anyone been in a job in which maybe there was a software that you used for years and then all of a sudden a new software was implemented. So there was a change in kind of how you documented what you did. Just put it in the chat box. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So as those are flowing through, boy, there's a lot of yeses. Uh, and I've dealt with this multiple times in my career. Now, I want you to answer, answer this next question. Was there any reluctance from you or your workers to adapt to this new program? Was there reluctance? Was there fear? Was there anger? Yes, of course. Now, it may, may seem like, yes, of course there was, and there is, that is very natural to have that, um, that uh, adaptation anxiety. Here's a really, really cool um, thing to think about. Ask yourself, were you able to adapt? Were you able to learn this new, pro new program? In every single interview I go in, I always bring up an example of how I've adapted to a new system. And the reason is the people who are loudest in change are people who are gonna be uh, reluctant to accept it. Even though it's a decision has been made, they're gonna be the ones that say, um, I like the way we did it before. This just doesn't work right. Why can't we go back to the old system? If you can demonstrate to an employer that You've been through this before. You understand that, hey, the decision's been made. How are we going to do this? And even, let's take the next step. Have you been someone who has been the go-to person to help coworkers with this? That shows that not only did you adapt to the change, but, and I hate to say embraced it because no one really, really lo loves change, um, but you're someone who was a go-to person within that change because change is constant in any business. And employers are looking for people who will adapt to that. I'm not asking you to lie, certainly, but think about what are your successes within that change. And if you were able to successfully learn a new program or a new process and help others to adapt to it, that's a huge, huge feather in your cap. And it's, it's a really good marketing piece that most people don't um, consider when they're in an interview. 
And it's not something you'll do off the top of your head. You kind of have to go into it with a game plan. And here's a skill set I have. Here's how it would benefit this employer. And here's how I'm going to demonstrate that. Here's the story I'm going to tell. All right. At this point, um, I'm going to let uh, Heather come on camera. Heather, are there any questions we need to get to? You know, there's no um, questions in the chat box. Um, a lot of really good feedback, um, personal experience from when they went through change um, and comments, but no questions so far. So if you have any, oh, please put them in the chat box. Yeah, I've actually been on on um, a couple of meetings or, or conferences that were all about change management. And it was amazing. Uh, it was amazing to me that so much effort is put into effectively implementing change. And that's a skill set. It, it's definitely something you can market about yourself. So, how identifying your skills helps you in your job search? Well, it helps every aspect of your job search. It helps you to prove your abilities to potential employers. And by prove, I mean you can bring up situations in which you've been successful with a skill, not just identifying the skill. That's the first step. The second step is okay, to what level do I do to have it on this skill? How has this skill affected the bottom line of my previous employers? What feedback have I gotten on this skill? There's a lot you can pull from that, but it all starts with the first step of identifying the skill. It also helps you to write your resume, of course, and complete applications. And it helps you to sell your qualifications in an interview. So again, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record, I think skill identification is the foundational knowledge that every job search requires. Otherwise, all you're doing is just putting out dates of employment, and where you worked. I've seen resumes that have them, by the way, or they'll or just put a, a, a bunch of keywords. They find some keywords in the, in the job posting and they'll put a three column bulleted list to say, customer service, time management. Those are what they're asking for. But if you've made a connection between what they're asking for and something you're good at, you're gonna be able to define that. You're gonna be able to prove that. You'll be able to sell it. All right, there are three basic types of skill sets. And notice that in this like Venn diagram, they kind of intersect a bit here. Don't get too crazy about defining and categorizing things, but I do, it is beneficial to kind of think of it in this way. So job skills are those things that are specific to an occupation. You never want to make assumptions about an employer's knowledge uh, because the assumption you're making is based on someone who knows what you know. Maybe coworkers are in a past job or your employer in the past job. Make sure you understand that, especially for larger employers, it's a, an HR person in many cases or a computer program that's looking at your resume. They're looking for keywords. They want you to explain your skill sets as they relate to the job posting. And many of us will make assumptions that leave things off the table. So you might say, well, I am a, and I use this example all the time, I'm a welder. Okay. And everyone knows that if you're a welder, you know how to use acetylene torch and a plasma cutter, and you know what MIG is and TIG is and cast iron and aluminum welding and all the differences between all of them. Not necessarily. Um, that's a highly specialized, there are many components or many different levels to which people can weld. And if you have skill sets above and beyond entry level, you know, toot your own horn. It's not bragging if it's true. Make sure you're letting them know what you can do within the, uh, within the, I guess, boundaries of the needs of that job. You don't wanna make yourself overqualified, but you certainly wanna say, I can do everything you need within this job and explain it thoroughly enough so that they can understand that. Um, so every job has its own job specific skill sets. Soft skills or self-management skills are more transferable actually. They should have a bigger part of this Venn diagram because these are things that um, allow you to interact with people. Uh, so these could be things like um, getting along with people, time management, customer service. Um, the one I love is, is timeliness. So we've all worked with a coworker that might've been very good at their job, but just could not show up on time. And if you're someone who really prides themselves on timeliness, and attendance and that sort of thing, you may say, well, that's that's assumed. That's something that um, everyone should be able to do. Not necessarily. And, and if you look back in your career, you're gonna know there's a lot of people who can't do that or aren't able to do that. 
if you're very, very dependable, figure out a way to describe that to an employer. Um, I, I, one of the other things I always include in every interview, I always say at the very end, you know, one of the things you can depend on for me is I, I will show up. I understand you don't want people coming in sick, but I have been through my entire career, been very dependable. And if you need me to be someplace and I agree to be there, I will be there. Um, and it leaves that kind of final impression that, hey, this is someone I can count on. They have the skills and I can count on them to be there to do it. And that's a soft skill. And it's not something you should assume the employer will know about you unless you mention it to them. Now, don't just put words out there to put words out there. If it's not something you can back up with facts, figures, and maybe a passion for what you do, don't, don't just put it out there. I'm saying put out there what you uniquely have. If you're someone who's really, really good at conflict management, great, talk about it. If you don't have the greatest attendance, you don't have to tell them about it, uh, but that's not something you would market about yourself necessarily because it's not true. Um, so people will always ask me, you know, I, this sounds like um, a bunch of rah, rah and, and, and telling them what they wanna hear. Um, certainly you wanna tell them what they wanna hear, but it has to be within the framework of what's true for you. And there's a lot of things we can market about ourselves. Make sure they're true and make sure they define and prove what you want them to um, know about you. Uh, the transferable skills are skills that are available in many, many different jobs. And these can be hard skills too. These can be job specific skills. So um, for many years, I was a manager of a computer training facility. Um, so I taught Excel, I've taught Excel for 20 years. There's very few office jobs in which that would not be a transferable skill. They may not want me to train Excel, but I'm going to use Excel in all of those jobs. So that's transferable skill. Customer service is transferable around all sorts of different skills. Timeliness, soft skills, are, I guess, just overall are more transferable, but do not um, bypass looking at your, your job specific skills because a lot of them are gonna be transferable also. All right, so there's a quote out there that uh, my people have the confidence of their convictions and they know their skills. Knowing your skills allows you not only to tell an employer what you can do, but what you're proud of, what you're passionate about. If your number one skill is that you really get to the root cause of why someone is having issues and you're able to um, bring that out of them and, and then help them, That'll show an employer that you're passionate about what you do. People who are passionate about what they do stay longer in a job. Um, that's another thing to, to make sure an employer knows, not just that you can do the job, but that you want to do the job. And if you identify a skill set that makes you proud of what you do, they're gonna say, this is a good fit for you. A lot of people are not hired, not because they can't do the job, but because they don't show enough enthusiasm during the interview. Again, not something you wanna fake. Don't, don't show false enthusiasm. But if you've identified what you like to do and you've chosen a job to apply for that would help you to do that type of work, that's gonna show in the interview. And employers will train someone to do a job if they've got the right fit. They'll train them on the hard skills if they've got the correct soft skills in many cases. All right, so we're gonna do uh, we've talked about the three types of skills. We've, uh, I hope, beaten to the ground, uh, understanding the importance of identifying your skills and then knowing how to interview, you know, identify your skills. And again, that just takes some time and a piece of paper. Look at your past jobs and ask what were the duties in that job? Of those duties, what did you do well? What did you like to do? Um, those are the things that should be top of your list. And this is not something you do once and then put on the shelf and use to market yourself for the rest of your career, we're constantly evolving. Our skill sets are constantly evolving. I like to say that I learn something new every single day. And at the end of the day, if I haven't, I seek it out. I Google something. Um, this morning I learned how to, um, why, I, I learned why um, certain records are hidden in Excel and why they show up when you copy and paste it to another document. Kind of obscure little thing that I'm putting in my back pocket as something I'll be able to offer myself and my employer the next time a situation comes up in which I'm missing a record in Excel. I'll know how to troubleshoot that. So we're constantly evolving in our skill sets. Therefore, our resume should be constantly evolving. And certainly on a case-by-case -case basis, 
we should evolve what we market because every employer asks for different sets of skills, even within the same industry. If you're a nurse applying for two different health organizations, the job itself may be very similar, but what they ask for might be slightly different. Um, so you might, even though you're applying for similar type of work, you may be marketing slightly different skill sets. Um, so keep an open mind and allow yourself to be fairly malleable or, or, or allow yourself to, to change uh, what you market and who you market it to. All right, so applications. We talk about this even more next week in the uh, tools of the job hunting trade, but when you do an application, it's really important to uh, have a game plan and know what an application is as opposed to a resume. An application is a filtering device. A resume is a marketing uh, product. So even though they ask for a lot of the same information, the purposes are slightly different. An employer says, fill out this application. Here's what you have to tell me. A resume is, here's what I want you to know. So they are slightly different. Um, we do repeat a lot of the same information. And I, I, I would caution you against leaving something off of your resume simply because you put it on your application. I've seen people uh, on their resume take all the dates, uh, all their employment um, jobs and their dates and just put a skills-based resume on there. Here's why that's not a good idea in most cases. Very, in larger organizations, it's the HR person who looks at the application and, and the resume, they'll look at both, but they're gonna look at that application. They'll be able to compare and maybe contrast the two. When it gets to the interview, the people that are interviewing you, maybe the manager, maybe some coworkers, they're not looking at the application. They're looking at the resume. And that needs to stand by itself to market you to this job. So they're always gonna look for um, employment history. So if you do have employment history, obviously it has to be in the application because they specifically asked for it, but also include it on your resume. Uh, make sure you have exact dates. That's not always possible, but do not go to the easiest answer of, oh, that, that employer is closed. I can't get those dates. It's really important to have the exact dates, if at all possible. And sometimes that's calling a former employer. If they've changed uh, names, if they've been bought out, they may still have your employment records. Uh, do it now. I mean, make that uncomfortable call. If you've been let go from a position, I totally understand that that's not, an uncom that's not a comfortable call to make. Um, but, you know, use it as an opportunity to reestablish some rapport, you know. Um, I, I kind of hit uh, two birds with one stone there. I would call and I would say, hi, this is Art. Um, I'm a former employee. I'm calling for two reasons. One, I would like to get my dates of employment, the start date and my termination date. And then I wanna make sure um, how that's listed in my file. I wasn't given a, a letter, a termination letter. Uh, I wanna make sure this wasn't you know, uh, listed as a, um, a permanent layoff or the job being um, no longer with the company. And also, could you tell me what information you give employers when they call to check on dates? Now you'll probably want to phrase that a little bit better, but there, I'm getting at some major points here. One is, if they have the dates, great. That's what can be proven. You've got the exact dates. So many people who are let go and think they are fired were actually on permanent layoff. It doesn't matter what you think of it as, it's what they will say it is that's important. And if you don't have to explain a termination, and by the way, great people get fired every single day. There's no judgment there. But if you can say it was a permanent layoff and that's what they will say, that's how you list it. That's the truth. Even though you may see it personally somewhat differently. Uh, you never want to say you were laid off if you were terminated or you were fired. That's, that's the truth of it. But you want to guarantee, you want to know what they listed it as. But then also, uh, many people are under the miss, um, are, are under the assumption that employers can only give dates of employment if someone calls. That's not true. Uh, many will only give dates of employment, but they can say whatever they want. The reason employers generally don't say whatever they want is they don't wanna be sued. They don't want you to come back and say, hey, you lied about me and that hampered my job search. But if you were, like if I were, I'll put it on me. If I were convicted of theft within my job and that's why I was fired and it was proven legally, an employer can certainly tell someone that. Why were you let go? Oh, he, he stole from us and he was, um, he was charged and convicted. 
that can be absolutely pr proven. There's no libel there, um, but most employers won't. Most employers will only give dates of employment. Um, and that's kind of a, a nice thing to know uh, because you've asked and they've told you. All right, at this point, Heather, it looks like there's a couple of questions. Yeah, we do have quite a few questions. Um, the first one is, what if you don't recall your salary amount? Um, is that something that you should go and ask the employer and verify? Yeah, you can. Um, I, I'm someone like that too. <laughs> if someone asked me my salary right now, I have no idea. Um, it keeps going into the bank every week and, and it's great. Um, actually, that's a good thing. That means you're not just going for the money, you're, you're ha hopefully happy in your job. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Yes, you could call your former employer and ask them uh, for your start, uh, your starting salary and your ending salary. Hopefully they have that information. There's also a process through the IRS in which you can uh, create an account and pay for that information. Now, I would never want to pay if I can get the information for free. So certainly do what you the best you can in that. Look at your former, your, your taxes, the taxes, when your tax statements. You should be able to find it on that also. Um, so there's a lot of variety uh, of ways you can get this information. It doesn't happen overnight though. So this is something you do before you get the dream job that you find and has to be applied for that day. You don't want to scramble for this information. I'll be sending everyone out a, um, a data sheet that you can fill out. It's a fillable form. I would, if you're looking for first steps, skills identification and that data sheet, fill that out now. Uh, that'll help you fill out all your applications. Great. And we do have one more um, frequently asked question. Um, how many years back do you go on work history in a resume and also um, possibly education in a resume? How many years sure. do you go back? So uh, we, we, we deal with this next week quite a bit, but you may not be here next week. So on the resume, usually we say 10 to 15 years. There are exceptions to anything you hear about anyone's advice on resumes, me included. Uh, if you have great work history that's extremely relevant and you isn't in the last 10 to 15 years, but is 16 years ago, of course you would include that in there. Um, as far as um, education, if education is required, it should be listed on your resume. If it's more than five years ago, I leave the dates off. On the application, they may ask you specifically, when did you graduate college or high school or whatever? I know that seems like an illegal question, but if it's on most applications, it's not because they're not asking you, you your age. They're asking you when you graduated, uh, which is just skirting it enough. Um, I don't worry about that. Honestly, um, the resume is where they're going to you know, be looking at when they're interviewing you. If you're worried about that, getting you to the interview that's an, a, a different issue but it's generally a legal question on your resume that's what we can, can control and what we can control is painting the best possible picture without creating any potential barriers in the mind of the employer so usually i leave the date off if it's been over uh five years all right uh, just finishing up on applications um, you certainly want to be honest on your your resume uh or excuse me your application and positive the biggest thing on an application that creates a negative impact is when people try to explain why they've been let go from an employer. And they'll go to great length of making their case. And I'm not saying that that's not true, that you couldn't have a potential, you know, really good reason why they fired you unjustly. But it doesn't help you. On an application, all they're looking for is can you do the job and is there anything I need to worry about? So we can't explain a termination effectively on a resume, or on, excuse me, I keep saying that, on an application. So the best method I can think of right now, and I've been giving this advice for many years, is just uh, state involuntary separation as reason for leaving that employer. That's telling the absolute truth. It's not putting it in extremely um, uh, powerful words. It's kind of um, making it, it's the same word, but, if I say I was fired or I say I was involuntarily separated, it just comes off better. Um, be prepared to explain the situation in the interview. And we go into that in the interview class, uh, but at application stage, involuntary separation. If you were uh, permanently laid off, if you um, were separated in some other reason, you might go into a little bit more detail so that the employer believes, uh, I know that sounds weird, but a lot of people who are fired will say they're laid off because it's just too emotional for them. Um, so if you were permanently laid off, 
maybe just a couple of extra, you know, uh, words in there, uh, permanent layoff due to job no longer existing within company. Um, a lot of people have been laid off because of COVID. It's, it's something employers are used to seeing. It's not going to hamper you in your job search. Um, just list what, what happened. Uh, make sure you use the keywords from the job posting. Use, it, use your space wisely. If you're writing it out by hand, write off a clean copy, meaning, and, and this still happens, by the way, if you're filling out a paper application, if you can take it home with you, awesome. If you can't, have that personal data sheet with you um, so that you're copying it as much as you can. All applications are slightly different, uh, but the, the majority of the information, you'll be able to put names, dates, that sort of thing. And if you're writing over from copy, it's going to be a lot neater. Um, so that's uh, one of the filtering devices for employers. If they're getting a ton of handwritten applications, they don't even look at them the first time. They just, just is this neat? Is this completely filled out? If it is, it gets into the maybe pile. If it's not, it gets into the trash file. Um, you can spend a lot of time applying for an applic uh, a job, but if you don't do it neatly and completely, uh, in many cases, it'll be filtered out. Okay, let's have a kind of a, a fun little exercise here. Call this an exercise, not a test. This isn't a, an intelligence test or anything like that, but I'm hoping it really helps you to define the importance of proofreading. So in this white area right here, just this white area, I want you to uh, read through this once, count the number of F's, F as in Frank, that are in these four lines, these four lines only, and put it into the chat box. Just the number of F's you see it should take you 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, we got three, 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 four, six, three, four, five, five, six, Three, 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 three. Now, I'm hoping this surprises you just a little bit because I have no doubt that the 100 people or so we have on today's call are extremely intelligent and have the ability to count the number of Fs. Like I said, this is not an intelligence test, but it does demonstrate something that might be a little surprising. When we read through information for the first time, we're as objective as we're ever going to be about it but we still have some things in our way of effectively proofreading. So if you saw three Fs in this, um, these lines, you're right. Finished, files, and scientific. Congratulations, you got three of the Fs. If you found four Fs, you're correct. If you found five Fs, you're correct. If you found six Fs, you are also correct because there are an F here, an F here, and an F here. Um, Many of you are saying, oh, I can't believe I, I missed that. Remember what I just said, reading it through the first time is as good as you're going to get, as objective as you're ever going to look at this information. This is, for many of you, the first time you've seen this information. Now imagine you've been working on your resume for a week. You're sick of it. You're way too close to it. There's no way you're going to look at that with a fresh set of eyes. So I'm hoping Everyone today, if you do nothing else with your resume, you have it looked at by a fresh set of eyes. Um, the 16 comprehensive workforce, or excuse me, career force locations in the state of Minnesota currently have openings for in-person, online, or over the phone um, appointments. And I'll be sending everyone a locator link so you can find the closest one to you. You do not have to travel there, but what you could do is you could send your resume there. Um, I, I'd certainly proofread it the best you can yourself first. Um, you can ask for a resume review. Um, what, what'll happen is you'll sign up for the appointment. Someone will contact you within a day and ask, how would you like to meet over the phone in person or online? And you can even do a kind of a webinar face-to-face -face with your cameras on if you want to. You can do it over the phone, you can do it through email, but you can also do it in person. Um, we do that as safely as we possibly can. Um, but that is something we just started doing last month, and we're looking to slowly uh, reopen to the public, and we just want to make sure everyone's safe. But uh, if you haven't been able to get your resume reviewed up to this point, that is an awesome thing to do. Now, just because someone doesn't catch, I mean, just, excuse me, just because someone reviews your resume, that does not mean they, they caught everything. They may ca catch a couple things, but one of the tactics I use in job search is I front end my references. Many people think of references as something that happens at the end of your 
uh, job search. Once you've interviewed, once uh, you are the chosen candidate, then they'll check your references. I like using my references at all stages. I don't overuse them, but what I would do is I would think, while I'm identifying skills, I think of who would be my best advocate for saying I have these skills? Who's experienced these skills? Now, ideally, that's someone you've worked with. Um, that's not always possible. Um, if it was a supervisor that you have a good relationship and can give a reference, that's awesome, but that's not where it should end. If you can't do it there, think of a coworker, think of a client, think of a vendor you worked with. And then here's a really cool thing you can do. You can let them know that, thank you. I appreciate ask them to be a reference, but also ask them to review your resume because this does a couple things. One, it gets a fresh set of eyes on your resume, but it also brings them into your job search a little bit more purposely. Now they not only know that you're looking for work, but they got your whole work history. They're gonna learn things about you they didn't know. And they're going to be looking for jobs for you not that you even ask them to, but they're just going to be very natural because they know you will want them to be your reference and they know you're looking for work and they have your resume. So just something to consider. A lot of people don't do that. I think it's a good job search strategy. So we did talk about the reason for leaving uh, involuntary separation. Just wanted to have it on paper here for you. Um, if you did resign, I wouldn't just say resigned or voluntary separation. I would add a little bit more if it helps you. So maybe you relocated um, due to, you know, maybe your, your significant other got a job out of state and now you are permanently here. You know, maybe you, you moved for a, a great job and you're here. Now notice I emphasize permanently here because that creates a question. If you relocated, um, you know, resign resignation due to relocation, great. They might ask you about it. The question they're gonna have is, well, are you gonna relocate again when another job comes up? Be willing and able to answer that question to uh, kind of alleviate their fears about you know why why you left and, and why you won't leave. Uh, and there, here's why. Um, it costs a lot of money to train someone into a job. That's a, a huge expense. And every employer has been burned by that, meaning that they hired someone that looked like a great candidate. And then six months later, after they trained them in, that person has left. And now they get to start the process all over again. So I always try to let the employer know that I made a very conscious decision that I want to work here and why I'd be happy here and why I would probably be here for a, an extended period of time. Now, that's not always true. We can't control the future. However, employers are always looking for those kinds of things. That's why they ask you, where do you see yourself in three to five years? Um, they want to make sure it's going to pay off for them to train you in, to invest in you. Um, now, Different jobs have different expectations. Some are, you'll show up tomorrow and that's great. Um, if I can, you know, have you here for six months, that's great. That's better than I've gotten for turnover, you know, in, in the last two years. However, for some other jobs, there's an extensive training period. There's a lot of investment and they wanna make sure that that's gonna pay off. So if you did resign a, a position, make sure you let them know in some way, shape or form that this is where you see yourself for, for the foreseeable future. All right, before we get into portfolios, uh, big, big uh, um, thing for me, I, I'd like to pause for just a few moments here, Heather. Yeah, I just wanted, um, we did have a good question um, regarding um, separation. Uh, the question is, is it detrimental to say something like medical reasons or voluntary separation for medical reasons? So I would never, if, here's the, here's the idea. On a resume or on an application, I would never say that because that poses too many questions. There's nothing wrong with it, but you can't effectively overcome any, not objections, but fears employers would have in the space allowed. So the key point is when you are asked in an interview, you know, well, why did you, why did you quit? Um, it's okay to say, you know, um, I was dealing with, uh, um, uh, you know, some personal issues or a medical issue which has since resolved itself and isn't an issue going forward, but I did have to take some time off uh, to deal with that. You can't put that all in, in the line. So you, you explain things if it benefits you, you leave it off like the reason you were terminated. You, you don't write the reason you were terminated, but you do prepare for having to explain it in the interview. There's not enough room to do it on the, um, on the application. So when they ask reason for, for leaving, um, you can say resign position, um, 
uh, voluntary resignation or something like that. Be prepared to answer any questions they have about it. All right, we're going to talk about portfolios. I'm a big believer in portfolios for many different reasons. So a portfolio is not an artist portfolio. Many of you may have thought of it that way. I certainly did uh, years ago. But I think of a portfolio as a takeaway for the employer, something I leave with them potentially at the end of an interview. Um, it's also something you just kind of gather for networking purposes, uh, for opportunities, having copies of your resume. You just never know when you're going to meet someone. And of course, you could email it to them. Uh, but there are times where, you know, paper resumes still have a place. But the main thing I use portfolios for is I bring them to an interview. Uh, it serves two purposes, really. One, uh, that immediate impact of they come out to get you at the interview. You know, you're waiting in there uh, potentially. Uh, we still do interviews in person. In fact, increasingly we're doing interviews in person. Um, but if you're waiting in a lobby, here's what most people do when they wait in a lobby. They're on their phone. Now, you could have your portfolio in your phone, but think of this immediate impression. They come to get you and you're doing this. I think this is showing up on camera. Um, I could be totally doing professional things, but they don't know that. What they're seeing is someone who is who is on their phone in this really, really important situation. Um, I don't know how they're going to feel about that. I do know that if they come in and I've got a folder open and I'm reviewing my notes and I'm looking at my resume and I'm looking at the job description, it just looks more professional. It's a better first impression. Uh, I know that may seem silly, but I've seen it over and over and over again. And also they're going to get feedback from the receptionist. Potentially, I, I always got feedback from my receptionist. You know, what did you think? And if they say that she, she was playing on her phone the entire time, that might not be the truth, but that was the impression. And that's what the feedback I got. Uh, so something to include in your portfolio. And this can be you know, that's not going to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be, you know, laminated stuff or in a fancy folder. It can be in a, you know, two cent manila folder. Um, include several copies of your resume. Because at interview, they, not, they don't necessarily have your resume, they should, but I've been in multiple interviews where they haven't. A uh, copy of your cover letter, if you have it, uh, your reference sheet. And I do include several copies of each of these. I waste a lot of paper in doing this, but I don't get that many interviews, so it's worth it. Um, letter of recommendation, if I haven't given it to them at this point, if I want to put it into that conversation, I, I firmly believe a letter of recommendation delivered at the appropriate time in an interview has gotten me a job. I really do because it was a tipping point. Um, some work samples, if that's relevant. And by the way, there's all sorts of different work samples you can include in a portfolio. If you're a welder, pictures of excellent welds. If you're someone who wrote a grant, maybe you redact or take out any, any information that you can't share, but show an example of your writing. If you've done some marketing, um, if you're an interior decorator, obviously there's, there's, there's things that be a little creative about it. Because this goes to the point of proving a skill as opposed to just talking about a skill. Uh, you don't have to go overboard with this, but I have been swayed myself personally when hiring by a, a well put together portfolio. It's never hurt a candidate's opportunities. It's only enhanced it. It's not gonna make someone who's unqualified the person I chose, but I don't generally interview unqualified people. I generally only interview people who I intend to consider. And someone who tips the conversation in their favor by, you know, having the courtesy to say, I put this together for you to help you in your decision, usually shows a skill set of being well, very well organized and um, problem solved. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot in just the fact that they put a portfolio together. Some other things to include is think about anything they would need a copy of should they hire you. So I'll tell you a, a quick little story. I um, I hired someone once and good employee, nothing wrong, um, but I had to get proof of everything this person had put on their resume and get it to my HR department in the in the Twin Cities. I was working in Duluth at the time. It took six months because I request he was working remotely for me on the Iron Range. I was in Duluth. They were down in the Twin Cities. The HR was in the cities. I'd have to email him something. He'd send it to me, and then I would send it to them. And then they say that's the wrong thing, and then go back and forth and back and forth. Um, the next person I hired, I don't know if this is the total reason I hired this person, but everything that I needed to get from her was in the portfolio already. Um, it was her uh, all the certificates she had, 
all of the education she had listed. She included her transcript in there. And so when I hired her, I just sent that information down to HR and I was done. No fuss, no muss. And that is huge. When you're hiring somebody, there's so much to do as far as onboarding them, training, coverage, all, all sorts of different things. The easier they make it for you, the more attractive they are as an applicant. Something to think about. All right, so within the portfolio, let's talk about branding. So if you've never heard this term before, branding has a lot of different definitions, but within work, think of it as making things familiar to having a, a, a similar message across your products, across your, your organization. So that means that if you were to um, look at a company's website, if they've gone through a branding process, they're gonna have a logo for all of their different organizations that kind of, you know, is similar. So maybe they have one logo for the overall corporation, and then they have a, you know, a little extra embellishment for a division or something like that. Also, the font they use on their website is gonna be similar throughout. Any correspondence they set up should be branded. There's all sorts of things we do with branding. For us, it's really simple. Everything you give to an employer should look like it comes from the same person. And this isn't always what happens because in many cases, um, just like I told you today, you may have a resume that you think looks pretty good. You send it off to someone to have it reviewed. They give you some examples back. Maybe they change the font, the margins, uh, how it looked. And now that's not from you, that's from someone else. So now your cover letter and your reference sheet that came from you do not look similar to the resume. Now you may see this, think of this as a small thing, but it doesn't take much time and even though no one's looking at it, it does make an impression and hopefully I can improve, I can prove that to you. So here is a re resume. Your resume does not have to look like this resume. This is just an example, but it's a, a, a resume that most employers would look at and say, okay, I can find the information I'm looking for. Um, you know, we have the uh, titles that are bolded and capitalized. So if I want to jump to something, I can find it. If I need dates of employment, they're right aligned. I can find it. I can find their contact information. Okay. So if your resume looked like this, and then you attached a cover letter that looked like this, you see the difference there. The resume is hopefully polished. It's very organized. It meets expectations. I look at the cover letter and it looks like a memo that someone sent out as part of an email, potentially, okay? Look at just what maybe a minute, less than a minute can do to enhance the perception of the cover letter. Now, keep in mind, I haven't talked about content at all. We haven't read anything on this cover letter, but we've already made determinations on how it made us feel. You know, we, we made some certain assumptions on it. If I did this to this cover letter, do you see the difference? Same exact content, but now it looks very similar to the resume as far as the format, the margins, the font. Um, it also has the same heading. I'm not, I don't know one employer that would say, send me a branded presentation. No one's gonna say that. But if I'm looking at this on my, on my desk and reading it, and this on my desk and reading it, there's a different initial impression. And by the way, it takes no extra time. You're just copying and pasting things over. Um, I'll be sending everyone uh, a link to our uh, online creative job search uh, program. And there are some samples to, to cover letters on there. Uh, no one wants to write a cover letter. We get a lot, I get a lot of blowback, pushback on cover letters, people saying, well, I, I went online and it says you shouldn't bother doing a cover letter. If you wanna find that information, you will find that information not to write a cover letter. I personally think it's just another opportunity to market yourself and it separates candidates. If they say optional and you do it and four other people don't, and it's a good cover letter, and it's branded, it can only enhance your chances. Will you write cover letters for jobs you're not getting interviews for? Certainly. Um, but the first one's the hardest one. Every one after that becomes easier. All right, I do wanna save some time at the end of this to um, answer any questions anyone might have. So Heather, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, is there anything we need to get to? Yeah, we do have a few questions. Um, the first is when emailing a resume, what format should you use? PDF, Word, or anything else? Uh, never, never anything else. <laughs> I'll be very firm on that. Uh, the one you wanna stay away from is trying to share a Google Doc 
Uh, I do a lot of people coming out of academics will try to do that. Um, that always goes wrong uh, or quite often goes wrong and certainly not like a word perfect or an ODF. If that doesn't mean anything to you, I, ho I hope you never have to deal with it. Um, word or uh, PDF are just fine. Be very aware though, if they request it in a certain format, do that format. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the beauty of a, uh, a PDF format is that um, they can't see any of your formatting marks. They don't know how you got that together. They just see the final product and they can't edit it. They can't change anything. Um, people always say, well, th this way they can't change it. If I am, uh, if I'm afraid that an employer is going to change my resume, I'm not applying to that employer. I don't trust that employer. Um, I always do it in Word for two reasons. One, I want them to see how I put them together. I'm a Word certified trainer. I, I use it as a, as a um, really as a work sample. Uh, but also, here's the most important part for, for job seekers. The one thing you can't do to a PDF is you can't edit it yourself. And hundreds of times I've had people come into our career labs and say, I just need to edit these two words on here. And you can't do it on a PDF. So even though the end product is, is, is great, the fact that you can't edit it uh, means that you're not going to be able to quickly adapt to the needs of a new employer when another opportunity comes up. End product doesn't matter. Word or, 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 or uh, PDF are generally accepted. Okay. All right. Um, one more question. Uh, do you or should you provide any certificates if they are expired? So, you know, I, I do have an opinion on this, like everything I've told you today, an opinion on this. Um, if it's like a CPR certification uh, and they require it, you could say um, formerly certified in CPR will recertify if needed. That's much better than not putting it on there at all and you're being truthful about it. Now you could maybe phrase that a little bit better. Um, if there are some certifications that you would be willing to recertify at uh, and they are required, um, they may say, I won't consider you if it's not certified, but I, putting it on there generally leads to that conversation continuing where leaving it off would stop the conversation. So um, it's situational. Uh, certainly don't put expired certifications that don't have any value to that employer. Um, but in, in many cases, I do put expired licenses with that little addendum, we'll certify it if needed. You can probably take one more question, then we'll wrap up for the day. All right, let's see, there's a couple more. Um, I think there's a there's two questions about invol involuntary separation. Um, one is um, they that person would have a severance package that they could um, not acknowledge per an agreement. How would they handle that? And how would they write an involuntary separation um, on an application or a resume? Like, um, we'll discuss in greater detail or different reasons prefer to give example in person or verbally. Yeah, so um, unless they specifically ask the, the situation in which you were involuntary, involuntary separated, in which normally they don't, you do not need to go into the gory details of it. Uh, as far as a severance package for a termination, um, I mean, that says something about there was some other information and there was something, it's a non-disclosure. If it's a non-disclosure, I'd call that employer and just say, hey, I, I know that's not always, at, at that point, it's a legal issue. Um, and every situation is different. That would be a perfect example of, of contacting the career force location, uh, getting a one on one appointment, explaining all the details of it, because there's definitely not a one size fits all. I just dealt with one of these um, a couple weeks ago, very, very specific, and I was able to give them advice based on that specific specificity of that of that situation. Um, every situation is different for those types of things. It's better to have a one on one conversation. Um, I will take a look at the chat. I'll make sure there's no questions we didn't get to. Um, if I can, I will reach out to you individually. But I'd like to thank Heather and the rest of you for attending today. Um, I hope you learned a few new things or gave you some ideas on, on how to enhance your job search. Remember, next week is job, uh, Tools of the Job Seeking Trade Resume Applications. Um, you do not have to take these in order. Uh, you can take them as you need. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. And I wish you the best of luck in your job search. Have a great day.